Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, I should say, actually, this is not really my main research topic. I am an archaeologist of the Near East, and my main interest really is about the past history and its significance to the wider world. So I'm writing a book currently on empires from this region and how they actually influence the region. And in some sense, I find it quite ironic that I'm talking about this particular topic because it really deals with some of the topics we just talked about, which is the region essentially beginning to disintegrate, fall apart, and lead to things like mass scale looting, destruction of ethnic groups, uh, the very wanton kinds of killings we're seeing as well. And so I'm actually interested in how the region in the very distant past became actually quite unified. In fact, uh, I think few people know this, but the term multiculturalism first began in the ancient Near East. This is a term that was invented in the ancient Near East. The homeland of multicultural societies begins in the past in those regions. And it's so, I, in, a, in a kind of twisted irony, I suppose, uh, we're seeing that sort of multiculturalism being destroyed uh, in front of our eyes, essentially. So uh, what we're going to do today is talk about some of these repercussions that is looting uh, that deals with this kind of disintegration. And so um, hopefully you'll see uh, both the political kinds of repercussions that are happening, uh, but I think touching on some of the points that were brought up in the previous talk, uh, what we can do. We, it's not, I don't think this is a situation where we can just simply hold our hands and, and sort of hope for the best. Uh, there are very direct things I think we can be, uh, be, do uh, to influence the situation somewhat. So we'll talk about that um, as well. So hopefully I'll press this correctly. So let's talk about some of the key events, uh, just as a quick background uh, before we get into the main sort of parts of the discussions. So obviously since the fall of Mosul, which has kind of been seen as a kind of hallmark moment, if you will, uh, for Daesh or ISIS, um, we've been seeing all these headlines in particular about uh, the kind of looting events, the kind of this destruction that's happening in the region. In other words, um, we're seeing this kind of headline banner or, or sort of headline grabbing kind of information uh, coming out almost on a weekly basis for, for a while. Maybe it's diminished more recently. Uh, but certainly, uh, as we just mentioned, many parties are involved in this kind of looting. It was certainly happening in Syria uh, long before ISIS even really showed up as a major uh, party or uh, group, so to speak. Uh, it started almost immediately after uh, the war began. Uh, and this is probably not surprising, uh, looting always in almost any region in the world, uh, follows essentially the breakdown of government, state authority. I mean, it's, it's comparable to the West in, as well. For instance, when you have, say, a major hurricane, I'm from the United States, so we have hurricanes. Uh, you get a major hurricane uh, in, say, uh, what happened in Louisiana uh, a number of years ago, about a decade ago, uh, you had looting happen right after that. And of course, that's because you had a, a breakdown of a temporary authority in the region. And so New Orleans was heavily looted in, in places. And this is basically a larger version of that essentially. Uh, what's different, of course, is now we have this ISIS group, this Daesh group, which is basically organizing some of the looting. And it's still only one of the players among other players. And, and part of the problem, I think, is that we're getting a slightly skewed understanding of what's happening uh, because the media, I think, focuses a little too much on just simply ISIS. Uh, we are actually having a very twisted kind of conflict. Uh, we don't really have any good players in this conflict. There are no good sides. And I kind of wish we would see more uh, that sort of portrayed in the press that basically everyone is doing a bad job in terms of what's happening in protecting Syria's cultural heritage and also leading to the destruction of its various cultural groups. Uh, yes, it's clear looting has accelerated in places since 2014, but really it's a question of, of exactly who is buying these antiquities as well, as well as the, the, the kinds of groups involved. We'll talk about that um, in a moment. So, one of the things we should also discuss is, is we should separate the idea of destruction of cultural property from the actual looting of objects. One is intended to give a message, a message to us, uh, perhaps a message to the supporters, and, and we'll probably maybe hear about this more a little later on, uh, but the destruction of things like the famous monasteries, so we have Mar el Yan uh, monastery that was destroyed not too long ago, the Mosul Museum, the, the ransacking of the museum, Nimrud, of course, we just saw, Palmyra, of course, the various uh, sites within Palmyra, uh, Nebi Yunus, perhaps one of the first sort of high-profile destructions that happened uh, in 2014, uh, as well as examples. In all these cases, uh, it was a message of ISIS that they wanted to give, that they're essentially doing their religious duty, uh, that they're essentially destroying these kind of apostate uh, 
uh, places uh, that were belonged to different groups or perhaps even other Muslims. In fact, what's interesting we should note is that most of the sites destroyed by IS or Daesh have been Islamic sites. Um, it's actually the minority of the sites are either the distant or ancient sites or the Christian sites. Uh, of course, they're, they're affecting all these groups, including the, the ancient past or the, the sort of heritage sites, uh, but we have to remember IS is causing a tremendous amount of damage uh, to the Islamic heritage uh, of the region, including the Islamic groups that are within the region. So what I like to do is, is turn this kind of high-profile destruction as kind of a ministry of propaganda, a sort of message uh, producing uh, organization, if you will, of IS. It, it, they may not have a formal ministry of propaganda, but essentially that's what this is. Uh, so the destruction of the arch that we talked about, the destruction of the two temples in, in, in particular, have been part of that message. And so that's not really, uh, that's really falling in line with this kind of showing that they're doing their religious duty by destroying these things. And thus, we're supposed to sort of believe that they are doing their religious duty and, and, and beginning this year zero kind of uh, sort of strategy. That is, wiping out the distant past, uh, starting anew. So we just saw a picture of Cambodia uh, previously, for instance, and that was kind of the same idea as mentality as the Khmer Rouge. Let's wipe out the previous culture, let's wipe out uh, what was there before and start anew uh, by destroying these sort of well-known symbols of the past. And I think that's what this kind of message uh, is being given to us, is displaying. But reality is, is a kind of practical end of what IS does. Uh, it might be focusing on the main parts, or did focus when it was controlling the site, on the main parts of the site where, uh, in Palmyra specifically, where you had the arch, the two main temples. So that would have been located, I don't know if you could sort of see the mouse, perhaps, or maybe not, but, or is there a pointer, right? So you would have had the main temples, the, the sort of main parts of the city would have been right here. But a lot of people are not looking at that. All around the city, there are many graves around Palmyra. And those graves have been looted for, for many decades. Uh, you could have found basically little statues, little busts uh, coming from these graves like this one uh, from Palmyra maybe 50, 60 years ago in the antiquities market. Uh, certainly it's happening now as well. And so this is an area that has been focused on uh, in looting for a long time. It has certainly picked up uh, since the outbreak of the war. So before IS showed up, uh, this region was already being looted. Um, and of course, what they're looking at or going after are these sort of busts. They're very portable, they're transportable, that is, they can be moved. Uh, the things that IS or Daesh is destroying was, were things that they cannot sell. There's no value to these things as far as they're concerned. Uh, they could only provide propaganda value in terms of a message, but they provide no monetary value. And of course, ultimately, uh, Daesh is essentially a state, or at least acts like a state in terms of organizing itself. Uh, so they need to get, generate some revenue, and those revenues are generated through the sort of indirect tax collection of antiquity sales. And so that's why these areas were potentially targeted. Now, we actually haven't got a, a formal report of the kinds of damage that have happened in these graves. We don't know how much damage has happened, say, during the period that Daesh was controlling this area. Uh, there are certainly some damage, and one can see on imagery some looting holes, uh, but the extent hopefully will not be that much. Uh, it's not very clear. Uh, what the extent is, but we'll probably be hearing about this in the months to come. Uh, as we just talked about earlier, uh, Aphema or Apamea uh, certainly has, uh, is it a good example of one of these earlier patterns, and it, it again shows that this looting is happening by a number of groups. So this was a region, uh, of course, that was heavily looted long before Daesh even showed up. Uh, this is, of course, what happened, what the site looked like before. There's a few little holes uh, in various places before 2011, but obviously, uh, in 2012, uh, things picked up quite dramatically. So again, it follows this kind of traditional pattern of looting happening when state authority begins to collapse. Perhaps there is potential collusion with the state in this case, or some of the other groups involved. Uh, that's not necessarily clear. We don't quite know how the other uh, sort of parties involved in this conflict uh, are actually involved or indirectly or perhaps directly involved in some of the looting. Uh, we don't hear so much about that, uh, but they certainly could be. Uh, so looting um, seems to be going on essentially everywhere. This is a map uh, of sites that have been documented to be looted. You can see the borders are a little bit incorrect in terms of who controls what territory. But generally, of course, the, the, the sort of um, opposition parties are control these regions and, and down here. Uh, we have looting, of course, occurring in those areas. The government areas are generally towards the west of the country and, and you have various looting happening there. And certainly Daesh or ICE is, is basically controlling these eastern regions, these Sunni areas, and then you have the Kurdish as well. The Kurdish groups are also involved 
or have sites within their territories that are being or have been looted. So essentially what we're seeing is a pattern that every side uh, in this conflict has sites uh, that have been looted uh, at various uh, times. Um, and of course the key difference is the organization. So uh, it's not clear if, if the Kurdish, the FSA, uh, and government areas are organized by the controlling parties, whereas in the IS area, of course, it definitely is clear that IS is controlling uh, the looting in a sense that they actually have a formal ministry. Uh, they even call it a kind of ministry of antiquities, uh, but typically you have ministry of antiquities in the Near Eastern states. Usually they're in charge of uh, sort of organizing the foreigners who come in to excavate. So when I go to work in the Near East, I usually have to deal with a ministry of antiquities. Uh, but of course what's different here is, is Daesh is basically a ministry of antiquities that deals with looting, uh, essentially selling antiquities or destroying them. So uh, that's what they do is essentially provide these kinds of licenses uh, to loot. And so this is an example of one, perhaps one of the best examples we have. Uh, this is what a license looks like. It tells you, tells you essentially it belongs to this uh, department that's in charge, this Qisim so that's basically the division of archaeology that's in charge uh, of this looting. And so it gives you a kind of permission here. Uh, so you'd be a, perhaps a normal person who lives in this region uh, who would ask for permission from IS. You would pay your fee, uh, and then you'd go ahead and start looting. So essentially what they're doing is putting an organization that allows looters to then go to the sites. Uh, they even sometimes provide things like dynamites, bulldozers, sort of the materials needed uh, to assist the looting. Uh, and then the looters would go ahead and do their own business. A lot of these looters were probably people who were already looters before the war. Uh, but now they're sort of operating within a kind of state apparatus, if you will, that, allow, that, that they have to kind of go through, pay the taxes, get the license, pay for the fees, those kinds of things. And these are the kind of things they're looking for. It's usually small antiquities that are very portable but also highly valuable. But usually the key sort of objective is, is small in size, high in value. Those are the kinds of uh, qualities you want when you're looting. And so not surprising. Uh, why we're seeing looting happening in potential grave sites. Graves tend to have fairly valuable objects. They often are generally small. And so they, 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 they sort of focus on these kind of small statues uh, in these graves. So the big question, of course, many of us have is what is the scale of looting? What is the sort of level of impact, the kinds of theft that's happening, and how much is actually happening? Um, the, an the short answer is we don't actually really know. Uh, we don't know how extensive in terms of sales. Uh, the State Department, the U.S. State Department, after doing its raid in Abu Sayyaf, uh, the compounds uh, in Syria last year, about a year ago, in fact, uh, they sort of put out some estimates on their website looking into roughly, using the, the documents that they seized, roughly how much sales uh, IS or Daesh is making from these things. Uh, and they said something on the order of millions, tens of millions, perhaps at most 10 million, something like that, could be something feasible uh, from this. And I think that is a potentially useful number in terms of giving an idea. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, uh, but I don't think this is a war where a lot of money necessarily is going into it. Most of the conflict we're seeing is that it's, not, it's actually not supported by large sums of cash. Uh, most of the problems are occurring with actually fairly low sums of cash, low kinds of uh, essentially weaponry uh, that causes a lot of chaos. I mean, we think of examples of like terrorist activities. They don't really cost that much money. Um, and so this kind of level of money funding essentially is not necessary to have tens or even hundreds of millions. So it's a good kind of a, a way to say it is IS or Daesh is essentially is a rich organization but a very poor state. Um, but by being a rich organization they can certainly organize a lot of activity that's quite nefarious and I think that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, but there are other potential proxies we can use. So uh, the US State Department has also put out slightly old data now. Uh, but you can see uh, sort of estimates by the U.S. Trade Commission of how much in terms of sales uh, of art, looted art or smuggled art, if you will, coming from different countries. So if we look at Sur uh, Syria and Iraq, we could see sort of, at least by 2013, a sort of upswing, and particularly from Syria, you go from roughly 4 million to 11 million. I don't quite understand how they derive these estimates, so don't ask me too much about that. Uh, but it, at least according to some sources within the State Department, they do seem to suggest that there is more activity of looted, let's just say, art, which antiquities would potentially fall under coming from these areas. And again, that could be not only IS or Daesh, let's say, but it could also be come from looted art coming from the government as well as uh, the FSA area. So again, it covers probably a more comprehensive uh, understanding of Syria rather than just simply IS, which tends to get more of the headlines.
Um, another kind of cursory example, this is uh, from uh, Neil Brody's website. He, he sort of runs a, a blog where he, he tracks some of these things and discusses some of these issues. Uh, and I, I, I picked this kind of small example. This is a small scale example meant to sort of illustrate uh, to sort of what's happening. Um, so just between November 2015 and February 2016, a very, what I would consider, what's generally considered, at least by the sort of trade, a, a relatively low value item. Uh, this is a, a Neolithic statue, essentially, a kind of little figurine, um, which is very specific to areas of Syria and Iraq. It dates from periods, it's called the Halaf, uh, which is a, a Neolithic period that uh, tends to be diagnostic for this feature. So um, I tend to look at objects uh, that are very early when I'm looking for looting because earlier sites or earlier periods tend to be very localized kinds of cultures or very localized kinds of patterns. And so we can tell this is going to come from, say, roughly Syria, Iraq, sometimes Turkey as well, but mostly from these regions. And so just looking at it over a, a short period of time, you can see 66 figurines, for instance, would sell for something on the order of a little over 6,000 pounds. Again, we're not dealing with high numbers, but we start to add these sort of uh, low volume, low sort of uh, you would say lower value kinds of items being sold over time, you do begin to accumulate a lot of money. And so one of the problems uh, we're finding is that there's a lot of focus on the relatively high value items. Uh, items that are say worth 50,000, 100,000 uh, pounds, things like mosaics for instance, or, or capitals, or other kinds of things that potentially uh, have relatively high value. Now it's good to focus on those things, uh, but I think we need to also focus on these lower value kinds of items because of course you get large volumes of them being sold, you start accumulating a fairly large amount of cash. And so one of the things that we haven't really looked at, uh, at least in terms of some of the things I'll mention later on, is really focusing on these low volumes kinds of objects. And as, as I mentioned, things that are, tend to be looted tend to be objects that are small and provide sort of easy ways of transports and of course are not noticeable when you get to things like the border control. Uh, in different countries. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you can easily sneak in to the UK and it's almost impossible for anyone to you know what, that, what it is even by the time it gets here. So this is the kind of thing that we should be actually paying attention to because it has potential uh, influence on the conflict uh, through the funds raised. Um, now, trying to understand the thefts that are going on, the kind of looting going on is a very difficult endeavor. Uh, there isn't really any good systematic study in my opinion. Uh, so the best piece that I can find, in my opinion, was actually a reporter piece uh, done by a guy named Mike Giglio, who actually was embedded, literally embedded, with looters uh, in southern Turkey, uh, as sort of the looting organizations, I should say, uh, that were operating in southern Turkey. Uh, so southern Turkey is kind of one of the chief hotbeds, or at least was, of where a lot of the looted materials would be going into. Not surprisingly, the, the borders uh, in southern Turkey were very open, which is why a lot of extremists go through century southern Turkey. Um, and so that also includes things like antiquities, other things being smuggled were going through the border uh, fairly easily. Uh, and so by doing a kind of investigatory piece, he sort of spent some time with some of the looters operating these smuggling rings uh, and got to know what they were sort of sending across. So he sent me various pictures, for instance. He talked to other archaeologists interested in this region, uh, started gathering information. We, we can certainly tell that a lot of these objects uh, certainly are real in many cases. So there's a good number of, of fairly real looking glass, coins, that, those kinds of things. But there's also a lot of fakes coming out. Uh, things like mosaics, for instance. Uh, some are real, but a lot of them are fake. Um, other kinds of things like inscriptions, jewelry. Uh, I've seen a number of fakes there as well. Uh, it's not surprising. Uh, we talked about how tourism was a major part of the Syrian economy. Uh, prior to the war, and, and that means there were a lot of artisans in Syria who made what objects that were similar to antiquities uh, for the tourists. Uh, and of course, these artisans have to, to survive. And it, it comes down to these, this quote, I think. Uh, we've been living in a war for more than four years. Uh, well, now it's more than five years. Uh, and so people certainly have to feed their children. Uh, and that ultimately wraps up, I think, why this is happening. Um, what I also find quite interesting about this piece is that it highlights another type of looting. Um, there are several ways in which sites are being looted. One is a kind of bulldozer dynamite way of looting a site. That is, you literally go to a site, blow it up, or just sort of knock off a big chunk of it, and you try to extract whatever you can of value fairly quickly and easily. Uh, so you see a bunch of seals, perhaps coins uh, often appear uh, quite easily, and those things get looted uh, fairly substantially. Another way is this, and I, I kind of wish we can run this video, but it, it's kind of difficult. But 
Uh, these are basically ac people excavating this site. And, and, and if you look, it, it, just looking at it, it looks like a, almost like a proper excavation. They're even excavating within these bulks. Uh, these are kind of ways to, one, one can control an excavation. Uh, they're digging carefully. They're using, you can see them using a brush here, for instance. Uh, so what they're looking for is very high value kinds of things. This is the site of Duraropus we just talked about. Uh, Duraropus, of course, is known for very uh, famous mosaics, uh, or not mosaics, but excuse me, but frescoes uh, painted on walls uh, that came from this site. Um, some of the earliest churches, for instance, uh, many temples. This is a city that had over 50 temples, had about eight languages. Uh, so when I talked about the Near East as being really the, the heartland, if you will, or even the cradle of multiculturalism, in my opinion, um, Duraropus was one of the best sites to see that. You would, you, there was a church, there was a, a synagogue, and there were something like 50 temples to various gods. Gods covering India, to uh, gods covering Roman gods, to covering other regions. So essentially you had gods from almost everywhere in the entire old world represented in this one small town. Uh, so what they were looking for are these mosaics from some of these places, that, or the, excuse me, these frescoes, which then could have potentially high value. Uh, so they're digging very carefully. So it shows you that some of this looting also is very professional. It's some of these previous excavators of these sites, or people who would have worked in these sites, uh, and digging very carefully to find these high value kinds of goods. So we have these two levels of looting, uh, one careful and one, let's say, not so careful and quick and dirty kind of job. Um, so then what happens to the items once they get looted? Where do they go? What's uh, what, who's buying them specifically? Well, as I mentioned, these border states are the critical place to look. And so that's why Mike uh, actually sort of spends some time uh, in Turkey. And then certainly Turkey has probably been one of the chief hubs. Lebanon traditionally has been as well. Uh, the Lebanese are sort of well known for their business acumen, uh, their connections around the world. Uh, so Lebanon, uh, certainly uh, Beirut was a, a major hub for antiquities for a long time and still is to some extent. Uh, Jordan, probably not as much. Uh, the borders in Jordan are, are slightly more tight uh, than they are in the north. So the level of antiquities going into Jordan uh, is, is certainly more, slightly more restrained, I would say. And in fact, I, I had my own experience of this back in 2003, uh, that the Jordanians do actually spend uh, some effort in policing for antiquities. I got stopped. I was in Iraq and Baghdad uh, right after the fall of, 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 of the regime. Uh, and on my way out, I was stopped by the police and they thought I was looting antiquities uh, because I had some coins from the Ba'ath era, 1960s coins on me. So, uh, so I, I was quite upset that these were not antiquities, in my opinion, uh, but at least they were doing their job, so to speak, uh, in that they were checking carefully what kind of objects were coming. So the Jordanians are historically slightly better uh, at policing their borders, I would say, than some of the other surrounding states. Um, so once things go to these border states, uh, what often happens is, of course, is the next sort of set of states. If you look at this map, actually, it's, it's almost like flowing the same kind of routes that perhaps the refugees are taking. That's probably not surprising. I would say some of these smugglers uh, involved in refugees are probably the same smugglers involved in bringing antiquities. Uh, I would not be surprised. Uh, so they're going to go to the next set of states, so Bulgaria, Romania. Uh, there's been a few pieces in the press of objects turning up there. Uh, there was a seizure that happened a few months ago of some objects coming from Iraq. They were certainly Iraqi based on the, the look of the objects, so that suggests they're coming from looted sites in Iraq. Um, and so after that, they most likely then go to the West, the, the sort of the Western European markets. Uh, Germany, Britain, Sweden uh, have been some of the key ones, France to some extent uh, as well, perhaps. Uh, we don't know this flow to be exact. And this is all somewhat conjectural in the sense that uh, it's following historical patterns, uh, but it, it, there are some known examples in these places where things have turned up. Um, so what's also different about this is that the way looting is happening now is quite different uh, from how it happened even just a decade ago. Uh, during this last decade, we've seen the rise of social media uh, exp exponentially growing. Uh, this has actually made moving things much easier. It's made the sale of antiquities much easier. You can now basically be on the borders of Syria and Turkey uh, using WhatsApp, you message your buddy in Germany saying, hey, I, I have this mosaic, uh, how much would you like for it? I have a client. On the other side, the person would say, I have a client set up, uh, he's willing to pay for it, um, here's the deal. Uh, now this kind of, sort of a small example is, is actually what happened in one case uh, from Turkey where, where Mike was able to show that these sort of sales would happen through things like WhatsApp where they would take pictures, uh, send these uh, sort of images and text information about the objects discovered, and then send it to someone uh, on, on, on sort of the, the Western markets. Uh, and of course, the Western markets aren't the only one. Some of this probably flows to places like the Gulf, uh, 
Um, so the museums there uh, certainly potentially are one source, perhaps private collectors, uh, also East Asia. Uh, Japan in the past has been uh, a market as well as other East Asian uh, countries and, and as well as Australia. So certainly there are multiple places where these things can be flowing to. Um, Germany, as I mentioned, is one example of, of some places where it has been turned up. In fact, Germany has, has been very good about this lately. They have tightened up their antiquities laws substantially over the last uh, year, year and a half, I would say, uh, where they've now made it much harder to sell these antiquities uh, in general. So there's been a lot of lobbyists by, or lobbying efforts by archeologists there. Uh, and so some of the things have been tightening up uh, in that particular country. Uh, but to be honest, uh, among all the various markets, relatively few really beat London. I mean, in all honesty, we kind of, it's a bit of an elephant in the, in the room. Um, so we can see, of course, major auctioning houses, but we also have many, many small auctioning or operations. Uh, some follow set organizations like ADA, which do a relatively good job in, in monitoring and, and also preventing uh, the sales of antiquity, uh, illegal antiquities, uh, but some do not. Um, and one of the problems that we're seeing is that I think this is partly where we can begin to be more effective in doing something in the Western markets. Um, it's still relatively easy to sell antiquities here without much regulation, uh, in the sense that you can sell things uh, and not necessarily have much detail about its provenance, its life history. Uh, so for instance, uh, there are far stricter laws about selling televisions or eggs even in Europe uh, that prevent or that basically mean that the consumer has a right to know where those eggs or televisions come from, right? So when, when you have a barcode, there's some kind of legislation that tells us that ultimately, if I had to find out where that egg or, or, or television came from, I can do that. We don't have that for antiquities. There's nothing like that. So when something is sold to you, oftentimes you basically have to believe the word of the seller. Uh, so one of the problems we're having uh, is that you can spot an object that comes from the Near East, but how do you know or, when, or do you know when that object actually arrived? Uh, that we don't know almost anything about in many cases. Uh, short of basically the antiquity dealer telling you this object was obtained from Syria a year ago, which almost never happens uh, because that's basically incriminating the, the seller, um, then you have relatively or often very little evidence. Sir, there, there are policing efforts. There's an there's a arts and antiquities unit within the Metropolitan Police, which has three or three and a half positions, I guess. Um, so they are doing a, a very good job. I, I work with them. I, I collaborate with them, I should say, uh, at times. So they, they are very good at proactive and, and sort of creating uh, networks of experts to, to, to talk to. And they've talked to me and others uh, a number of times about these things. So they certainly are very active. But it's, it's definitely not enough. And there's a lot of, of this world that we don't know about. Um, so it, it's, it's one of these things I think we need to sort of uh, work with the trade, the legal trade, uh, to sort of know more about who's involved, potentially involved in this. Um, and try to get to, to sort of understanding how illegal antiquities are brought into this country. That's something we still don't quite understand. Um, we hear a lot from people in the trade saying that it's not coming into the market, it's, not, it's barely there, and there, there's maybe some truth to that. It's not coming in huge droves. Historically, we know what generally happens is that when objects get looted from a country, they don't often get sold right away. In a, in, a, in a Western market or in a, in a market. They usually wait a while. They put them in storage for some time. They may wait five to 10 years, and then they begin to flood the market. This is actually what happened slightly in, in terms of the 2003 Iraq war. Some of the things that were looted in 2003 did not appear in the market until sometime, some about five or six years later, they began to appear. So there's kind of a wait period, particularly if a story or, or, or news is very interested in the topic. So in this case, we have a lot of press interest in objects coming from Syria um, and Iraq. And so the, the likelihood is that we're not going to hear very much, uh, or not, we're not going to see very much uh, objects being sold openly uh, from these regions, because of course, it, it would almost be very stupid for a dealer to do that. Uh, so that's what we think is happening. There may be a period of time where these objects will, will sort of wait in storage, if you will, and then begin to appear on the market more openly, perhaps, or, or perhaps just go simply to, directly to buyers who are already pre-established using social media, as I talked about uh, in the earlier example that I gave. Uh, so as I mentioned, some of these kinds of things that are used by some of these deals, WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, eBay, you find lots of things from the Near East on eBay. Uh, again, all the problems with, with particularly eBay is that you don't know when these objects came. There aren't rules about displaying what's the life history of these objects. So, I can go on eBay and say, that's a Near Eastern object. That's a Phoenician-looking uh, glass, for instance, or a seal that comes from 
uh, Syria, most likely, from this period. I can identify that as an expert, but I cannot tell when this object arrived to a certain location and when it was obtained. And so these kinds of lack of, of forcing the dealers, the sellers, to disclose this information, I think creates problems uh, in that we don't actually know enough about the life history of these objects. And I think that's where one of the key loopholes, if you will, one of the key holes uh, that we have in current legislation is that there just isn't enough requirements uh, for all objects to be clearly disclosed to us in terms of their life history, their provenance, uh, and when they came. And, and, and in cases where there are, where there is information, oftentimes it's information that doesn't seem very well of high quality. So it looks like a piece of paper that someone literally just signed their name. You don't know who they are. There's no authority regulating it uh, and a simple stamp or that kind of thing. So it's something that's done in an ad hoc fashion, uh, perhaps to give a buyer a kind of assurance. But to be honest, uh, most of these things don't have very clear uh, information, uh, almost all objects you buy. So many sites looted are, if we're looking at also the pattern of looting, one of the things that we do notice is that many sites looted are, tend to be Hellenistic and later in date. That's not surprising, perhaps. There's a large desire, if you will, for, for, in the market for classical and later kinds of uh, period objects. Um, the problem is that many of these sites, uh, from an archaeological point of view, are more difficult to provenance. Uh, such objects are fairly ubiquitous no matter where you go. So, for instance, you find uh, a statue of, of, of Hercules. You can find that in Britain or in Syria. It could almost be the same exact statue. Uh, in, in the classical periods. Uh, so it's hard to really pinpoint the location. So one of the things that we've been doing is focusing more on these earlier periods, Iron Age, Bronze Age periods, where one uh, has much more localized kind of uh, artistic patterns one can use to localize objects to find where they potentially come from. Uh, so again, the burden of proof of looted items is not on the antiquity seller, it's often on us, people who want to know if there are objects that are being looted, uh, and that makes it a bit of a problem as well. Um, so cylinder seals uh, are one thing that I, I look for because these objects are the exact kind of characteristics that I talked about. Small, portable, oftentimes can be of high value. You can buy a seal for something like five, six thousand pounds in places sometimes much higher. Some seals are worth, worth far less. Uh, they vary in value. Uh, tablets, uh, cuneiform tablets. This is a, a kind of writing system, Akkadian. Um, which was uh, invented uh, 5,000 years ago. Writing begins in this region. Uh, so this is the kind of writing style that was invented. Uh, so tablets are, of course, of high value. Sometimes they're mundane kinds of tablets that talk about economic transactions. Sometimes they're very valuable. They t tell you stories uh, that have uh, parallels to sort of biblical stories, perhaps, or even other kinds of stories. And so they, they can be quite valuable. Um, proof of when they were taken, once again, is usually the hard part, proving you know, in this country for 100 years, 10 years, 5 years, we don't know. Now, in terms of specific cases where we know some objects have been coming in uh, from Syria and Iraq, uh, I can talk about a couple where I've been involved with. So one was a case where I was involved uh, with a local sort of port authority uh, that seized a container item full of mostly, um, I would say, antiques, uh, not antiquities. They were objects that were probably dated last few hundred years, uh, gold, jewelry, necklaces, that, that sort of thing. Uh, but within that container, there are a couple of objects that were quite old, in my opinion. Uh, one of these was a bracelet, uh, probably dates to about 500 BC, something like that. Um, as you can see, a bronze sort of, um, bronze copper kinds of uh, bracelet. And then you have to the right this sort of base, I'm not quite sure what it is, to be honest, uh, but this sort of base uh, that was found, uh, which may be Iron Age or, or later. Uh, so in these cases, it looked like antiquities. Uh, the Port Authority informed me that it came from Syria, which should have been, a, I guess, a red flag. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they stopped this container, and they sent these pictures to me. And I said, yes, please do seize these objects, because they look like they're ancient, basically. Uh, but in this case, uh, what do you think actually happened? Well, uh, it was released. Lack of evidence cited as a main reason, which I'm not quite sure what the lack of evidence was. Um, so these items were eventually let go. Uh, to the person. And, and by the way, the person who was importing these objects was a known antiquities dealer, uh, even though a lot of the items were actually antiques, not antiquities. Uh, nonetheless, uh, they were going to this person uh, due to a lack of evidence. So one thing that opened my eyes, I think, in this case, is that um, customs in this country doesn't actually work exactly the way the customs I was used to. Customs in the United States had a much more policing authority. And I know there are laws in this country where customs can essentially, essentially act with some policing powers. But generally, 
customs is treated as part of a revenue service. And so, therefore, there is pressure, it seems, from what I can gather uh, from talking to various individuals, uh, on releasing items without very substantial evidence, essentially. So there's nothing like ICE. There's, ICE is an organization, for instance, in the United States that is a kind of policing authority within customs. They have the power to seize, and they often are very active in seizing objects. So uh, in the United States, for instance, I'll give you an example. In 2003, uh, after the war there, there were also cases where customs uh, did call me uh, about objects that they had stopped. And they were very active in seizing objects uh, and taking them away from sellers. And so we know that, at least in the United States example, they were very active in taking objects. So one thing I've, we've, we've seen is that perhaps there needs to be some updates there uh, in terms of the laws and the kinds of uh, policing powers uh, customs at least applies. Maybe in practical sense that there isn't enough uh, police uh, push going on in, in terms of the custom activities. I'm not sure, but this is something that has kind of opened up my eyes. Maybe we could discuss it later on. Another case, which was, I think, featured uh, in the ch this Channel 4 documentary that came out a few weeks ago, um, is this lintel. This is a, a lintel that was uh, in a shop uh, in, in New Bond Street area, um, which was uh, mentioned by the owner. The reason why we, we knew this was from Syria happened to be because the owner said it. So remember I mentioned that the sellers do not have the burden to really provide that much proof to us. So you have to basically wait for them to slip uh, before we can move. And so in this case, the owner actually mentioned, oh yeah, this piece is, is from Nawa, Syria. Nawa, Syria, of course, is in a region that's now currently under conflict. It's, it's under current FSA slash Nusra occupation. Um, but it's within the borders of also, uh, or near IS area. It's also near the government area. So it's one of these conflict kind of places. Uh, this is derived from a, a Byzantine house, it seems. Uh, it's a lintel, uh, so it would have been a decorative piece along the top of a wall. And this is a, one of the publication pictures from the 1930s. Uh, I should probably point to it so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, this piece right here is from the 1930s. Uh, this is the picture of the item in the shop. So this is basically taken, I think, in November uh, last year. So it's the same object. You can see it's been broken. Uh, there's another picture from the 1980s of this object, uh, which was found, uh, I think, uh, as well through an Interpol site. Um, <clears throat> and it shows you that, of course, one, this item is published. Uh, two, this, the, the image the fi uh, of the 1980s that shows the same object proves that the object must have been looted. Uh, by the 1980s, Syria had a very stringent antiquities laws. You cannot remove known monuments. You cannot remove archaeological sites and export them. There are very strict laws in most of these countries. Um, so Syria certainly protected its antiquities, at least in terms of the laws, uh, prior to the conflict. And so this certainly would have been an illegal removal if this item was sold. And it seems to be in the case, since it was present in Syria in the 1980s, it must have been removed illegally. So that's another sort of example of an item that's been looted and brought here. Once again, we still don't know exactly when it came. It could have been pre-2011, uh, probably was pre-2011 in my opinion. But uh, this is again showing you the problem. We don't have enough information of pinpointing the date. And we only knew about this because the shopkeeper essentially slipped. Uh, we wouldn't have known about it, uh, about it otherwise. Uh, but it gives us an example of the kind of demand that potentially exists in markets like London. So the reality is we don't know enough about looting coming into Western markets. We know some through sort of examples that I gave you, such as the, 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 the Port Authority one, as well as uh, this lintel from New Bond Street area. But it is arriving in the West, is the point. Uh, it's observed now and documented to some extent. Uh, I think we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. I think we're going to see more in the, in the years to come, because knowing the pattern of looting in the past, we know these objects tend to hit the market more so when news and the media have died away. So more likely we're, we're going to see more objects in about you know, a few years' time frame, let's say. Um, we don't know the scale is another issue. We don't know how extensive uh, things are being brought into the country currently. Uh, we're likely just getting a small part of the story. So in the end, it's not hard to sell antiquities. You can see it's, it's very easy to bring small objects, small sort of uh, figurines, uh, sell them perhaps for, for low prices. Um, these larger objects even are getting through, like the lintel, for instance. Uh, clearly, that could have been stopped if, if, if uh, people were aware what it, what it should be or what it was. Uh, so you have to get greedy, basically, or do something really stupid. Uh, similar to perhaps what the shopkeeper did, maybe unknowingly, or simply making an honest mistake. I mean, I think actually this, in this case of the shopkeeper, I, I don't think he necessarily knew uh, the item was, was looted. 
Uh, so it's possible that people are making honest mistakes in selling these things. By the time these things move through many hands, from point of origin in Syria to the seller, uh, it's not necessarily clear to the seller, the one who's selling it, the object to someone buying it, that, that this object necessarily was looted. It may have been obtained, as far as they know, in a legal way. So once again, we don't have the documentation, life history of objects, so it's impossible to really know uh, what's happening to these objects. Um, so I want to talk about some positive things that are happening. Uh, so we talked about the memories of 2003 uh, perhaps being still somewhat fresh, I think fairly fresh in our minds. Uh, and I think that experience, the lack of planning, there was, I should say there was planning, uh, certainly on the American side. I was involved in some of the planning uh, in 2003, working with um, some of the, the State Department's uh, Future of Iraq projects, where we did actually meet and, and give very detailed plans of what should be protected. And number one was the museum. But of course, as history now says, no one listened to us uh, in terms of the planning. But there were some steps taken, uh, I should say, before 2003. Now, that experience of 2003, I think, though, has led to, um, particularly Britain both and the United States, to be more proactive, I think, in terms of what's happening now. Uh, there are steps, as we mentioned, measures being taken to sort of per at least try to do something uh, with looting, and particularly the link between looting and fundamentalism, the terror that we're seeing, uh, is also gotten the interest of not just, uh, say, cultural experts, but also, of course, policing and FBI and other kinds of organizations that are interested in, in more sort of terrorist activities occurring uh, in different places, uh, CIA and all that. So there are more interests certainly happening. Uh, in, in Britain, uh, we see, of course, recent initiatives. We just talked about the British Museum receiving some of this cultural fund. Uh, and there's going to be more money released uh, coming up soon uh, as part of that 30 million cultural fund. So that we'll see uh, hopefully an active bidding process and, and we'll see what kind of projects that are funded. So once again, the focus will probably be on Near East um, and probably related to protection, replication, and perhaps even some legislation efforts to try to uh, tighten up some of the antiquity <laughs> law. Um, and uh, related to what we just heard from this Queen's speech, uh, just yesterday, uh, the all-party parliamentary group, which was put together uh, back last year. This is a picture taken from uh, that initial launch event uh, with Boris uh, as well as David Burroughs. Uh, this is Walk of Truth. Uh, this is uh, Tasula uh, Khajatofi, who represents one of these organizations involved. Um, so this all-parliamentary group was put together in part to sort of look into the trade uh, and perhaps create some suggestions. And one of those suggestions were to, to sort of uh, adopt this Hague Convention, and, and it's nice to see that, that, that lobbying efforts come to some fruition uh, by the all parliamentary party group. Uh, so there were some benefits or some uh, positive outcomes coming out of that. So in the UK, of course, discussion now on getting the Hague Convention protocols put into law is, 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 is towards the top uh, of the discussion. Uh, there are, I think, more practical things too. For instance, tightening up some of these regulations of, of how you sell antiquity. So for instance, the kind of paperwork that's required uh, the licensing, uh, perhaps the burden of proof should be on the sellers. Uh, I think, in my opinion, that, that's one thing I'd like to see, is that we, we put more pressure on sellers to show evidence that they're not selling looted antiquities rather than someone like me having to prove that they are not selling or not selling uh, a looted antiquity. So that the, the burden of proof, I think, in my opinion, should be on the sellers. Uh, and if we change that law, then that would be a much more substantial uh, benefit, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so we're seeing some, benefit, uh, some new changes in laws in Germany, for instance, tightening of the laws regarding provenance. So Germany certainly is, is beginning to uh, address this issue of provenance. Uh, so I think we need to begin to do that as well. Um, so this quote of, this came from a newspaper. Uh, that, that's why I got this sort of egg example. It's, it's easier to provenance an egg than antiquities currently. Uh, and so we need to change that, I think, that, that, that dynamic. Uh, so legislative acts, of course, are good. Uh, they should force dealers to provide convincing evidence of where provenance or even uh, having the licenses of selling these things should be done. But the reality is, let's face it, even if all these laws got passed, including the Hague Convention, uh, is that it's still going to be hard to enforce these things. Uh, criminals will always be criminals, uh, and people will always do bad things, I suppose, or, or stuff will always happen. Uh, but the point is, is that we still need to sort of do something else, I think, more than just creating laws. Laws take a long time to create, they take a long time to implement, they're often poorly implemented uh, in cases, so we, there are other things I think we can do. Uh, so I think social stigma, something as simple as that, is actually quite effective, and, and perhaps the best example I can think of is the blood diamonds uh, stigma that was created uh, a little over a decade, or more than a decade ago now, uh, 
Um, so in this case, it did dent some of the trade, not completely successfully, but some of the trade certainly was dented. This idea that people selling diamonds uh, had to make clear where they're getting their diamonds from. I think this is something we can do for antiquities. Uh, we should make it clear that people who are selling antiquities should make it clear where they're getting their objects from, um, when they got their objects as well is very important, uh, and how they got their objects. So a kind of stigma effect, if you will, a campaign, if you will, I think could be potentially more useful. Uh, certificates, perhaps, so you have, for, for instance, companies now that sell diamonds use certifications that indicate that they, gotten, they obtained diamonds uh, that were not obtained from conflict regions. So I don't know, see why we can't do something similar for antiquities, a kind of certification process that has a proper authority over it, so it's certified, truly certified, that these antiquities were not obtained from a conflict region. So perhaps this, if the Hague Convention gets passed, that's something that could be a, a, a way to implement the Hague is by having some authority, some authority to sort of implement that these, there are certificates that, that certify objects are not coming from conflict regions. Uh, as we saw this sort of arch, whether, whatever you think of it, uh, in Trafalgar Square with, in terms of the, the Palmyre arch. Again, I think it's useful because I think it brings attention to the, the issue of, of Syria, its antiquities, as well as Iraq. Uh, and how it all relates to current events. We talk about the refugee crisis, uh, and I think this ties in with the refugee crisis, uh, funding of activities uh, that relate to violence that are coming through antiquities uh, will, of course, lead to things like refugees. And so we do have to tackle this problem because uh, it does affect uh, what's happening in Europe, and certainly discussion about leaving the EU and those kinds of things are actually indirectly or, or directly related. Uh, antiquities monitoring. So there's a lot of uh, sort of, uh, I would say, bottom-up efforts. Uh, one organization, uh, in particular Walk of Truth, is very much involved in this, where they're trying to create a globalized network of common people, basically normal people, who are, who are aware of antiquities uh, being sold in given places. They provide tips, almost like a hotline you would with police. So for instance, think of crime watchers. Um, so they even call it a kind of cultural crime watchers. So. Uh, in this call, in a, in a kind of crime watchers program, if you receive a tip, you can send that tip then to the police. The police can have a chance to react. Uh, a case is created, and then they begin to investigate uh, particular things. So these kinds of things, I think, are initiatives, if you will, are very good because it allows, empowers people. It brings in communities, including uh, some of the people from the region, so Syria and Iraq, where the refugees are coming. There are probably, as I mentioned, some of the, the, the smugglers uh, for people are probably the same smugglers for antiquities. Uh, perhaps some of the refugees may actually be knowledgeable about antiquities being uh, sort of smuggled through these routes. So that perhaps bringing them into the conversation might actually be quite useful uh, to this in terms of putting them uh, in a position where they can begin to divulge more information about antiquities they may have spotted. Those kinds of examples, I think, uh, are potentially proactive and useful kinds of results that can come out of what's happening. So I'm sure there are more things. Uh, that one can do, uh, but I think this is the beginning. Uh, I think I'm very happy to see that at least it was sort of mentioned uh, the, the the Hague Convention uh, in the Queen's speech yesterday. There was there was effort behind the scenes certainly to lobby for that. So that's that's good to see that. But there's I think things we can do as well uh, in terms of uh, sort of creating this social stigma, um, as well as perhaps being involved in some of these uh, antiquities monitoring kinds of services like Wanko Truth, can help us begin to take a more proactive. Uh, efforts in, in combating the looting of antiquities and perhaps also do an effort to, to really stop groups like IS and others involved in this kind of uh, activity. So thank you for your time and hopefully we'll have a nice discussion.